Hi, Andrew from SACS, and welcome to video number six in our seven video sequence on performance development, including 360 degree feedback. In this one, we'll be talking about performance conversations. We have to have a conversation with somebody to say, okay, well, something needs to change here. Those conversations are very heavily avoided by many leaders because they're uncomfortable and people worry about them at a kind of an emotional level, but also at an industrial relations level. How do we do this in such a way that we don't trigger some sort of a dispute? So we'll be giving you some suggestions about how to do that. We've posited a model where the entire process is based on goal setting and then performance conversations. So performance conversations are absolutely crucial. If you're going to develop a new performance development system, train people, not just in the process of what the system requires of them, but also train them in goal setting and in performance conversations. Skills in both those areas will be helpful both for leaders and for staff members. Now let's talk about feedback. People hate feedback. Now, people will dispute this, but all you have to do to prove it is walk up to somebody and say, I have some feedback for you. Look at the fear, anger, disgust in their eyes. Very few people say, oh great, you know, tell me. You know, <laughs> they might say that, but they don't really mean it. And if you hook somebody up to functional magnetic resonance imaging, for instance, and you say to them, I have some feedback for you, you'll see the amygdala light up. And that means that you're getting either anger, fear, and depression. So feedback is bad. And in fact, David Rock, I mentioned him earlier in this sequence of videos, has said that we should dump the in whole formal performance development process because it just leads to inflamed amygdalas. I don't agree with him. I think it can be done well, but it's very important to avoid feedback in a traditional sense. Let's look at a piece of research from the Corporate Leadership Council. This is a very big study, admittedly an old study now, but the reason that we cite it still is that firstly, there's been nothing of the same scale and the recent research hasn't changed that much. And what they discovered was that emphasis on performance strengths brought about the greatest change in performance. In other words, you could improve performance by in excess of 35%, purely and simply by catching people doing something right. When we talk about performance development, I think people think of the negative, they think of the redirection, they think of the correction. But in fact, many leaders don't have this confidence or perhaps skills or awareness to catch people doing something right. And that is the single most powerful thing that any leader can do. The second most powerful thing is emphasis on personality strengths. What does that mean? Well, it's things like, I like the fact that you're happy, or I like the fact that you're helpful, or I like the fact that you're really hardworking and conscientious. Emphasis on specific outcomes of formal performance review. That works, provided you do it right. Look at this though. It's nowhere near as effective as simply catching people doing something right on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's an incredibly powerful lesson for leaders. Just doing that is almost the most productive thing that you can do for people's well-being. And not only really that, it might surprise them. When I'm running this stuff as coaching, people often say to me, well, what about if it's inauthentic? Well, if it's inauthentic, don't do it. Do it authentically, but surely you've got opportunities to say, hey, that's a good report, or thanks for the way you helped me there, or, you know, I really like the way you talk to that customer. That kind of stuff can be really powerful. Things that cause performance deficits are things like emphasis on performance weaknesses. Emphasis on personality weaknesses is also a negative, and I don't know if you do that, but I mean, <laughs> that suggests, well, I don't like the fact that you're a happy person, or I don't like the fact that you're a sad person, or something like that. I, I can't imagine that that's an effective conversation to have ever. But I think sometimes people think that performance development is about, oh, I've got to have a, a hard conversation with this person, so I'll say this or I'll say that. And I think that one of the reasons that people avoid that stuff is because they actually don't know the words to use. They don't really know how to have a conversation of this sort. Let's look at a model that might work. There has been a bunch of research, including Cable, Van Werkham and Klum, where we talk about strengths-based change. In other words, feedback from others regarding one's strengths, produces positive emotions, raises strengths awareness, and you end up with people applying it productively. So this is much more recent research, but that really backs why the Corporate Leadership Council found that catching people doing something right is a good thing to do. As well as that though, it's contagious. So when you catch people doing something right, they go, well, okay, well, I'll keep doing that. And other people see them doing that and it tends to become con contagious. Now, sadly, negatives are more contagious than positives. And that's why as leaders and as members of work groups, we have to work really hard 
to get as many positives in our interactions as possible because that will work. So does this mean you we dodge the hard stuff? No, I'm not naive enough to suggest that all we need to do is walk around congratulating people to have a really successful organization. I will say I don't think people do that often enough. And certainly when we run measurement of these kinds of things like 360 degree feedback, we virtually never get feedback that this leader does it too much. Most people feel that the leader is just doing their job and maybe they just don't get around to saying, hey, thanks for that, that was great. I really appreciate that this is good work, that kind of thing. So do you redirect the negatives? Of course you do. But instead of using the technique of feedback, you use the technique of feed forward. And the concept there is rather than saying, this is what you've done wrong, which is the default, the natural way for many people to deal with it. What you say is, this is what I need you to do differently in future. So let's give you an example of a feed forward conversation. Feedback would be, Mary Smith turns up late for work and you say to Mary Smith, you were late to work this morning. And in fact, a lot of people leave it there. Now you may additionally say, and I need you to come to work tomorrow morning, but Mary Smith has been called into question and her amygdala has turned on. The alternative is to do it simply in a feed forward basis to say, Mary, I need you to be at work at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Now Mary might say, well, are you saying I was late this morning? I don't wanna get into that. I need you to be at work at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. And if she raises it again, if she questions it again, persist with the statement. There is research evidence that feed forward changes behavior more quickly and more enduringly than feedback. So in education programs where people are given feedback versus feed forward, feedback causes them to learn less quickly than feed forward does. Now, the other thing is that from a judicial point of view, if you've got an industrial relations question, one of the things that any judiciary will ask you, they'll ask you two questions. Question number one is, did you make it clear what your policies are and did you follow those policies? Question number two is, did you make it really clear what this person needed to do in order to keep their job? Now, if you do both those things, you can do it very effectively, especially the second one, with feed forward by saying, this is what you need to do to keep your job. So in effect, you ratchet up if the person continues to not meet the standards of either behavior or performance, really clear indications of what's necessary in order to keep the job. And of course, ultimately, if that's not remediated, then of course it would ultimately lead to a separation, but that should be the absolutely last thing. You've got many points along the way where you can remediate and therefore cause the employee to be back happy, safe, and productive in their work. The idea of feed forward is that you dodge criticism, you take the issue, and you bring it straight to clarification of expectations with a focus on performance, not the person. Feed forward works. Good, strong research evidence to show that. And so this study by Budworth in 2015 showed that people where there was a feed forward conversation performed significantly better than people who were involved in feedback conversations. So, there's lots of research evidence to back this as a method. And as well as that, I find that when leaders understand that a feed forward conversation is all that's necessary, they don't have to get into the dredging over the past. I find that they're more ready to have those conversations. They're more happy to embark on the whole venture when they don't think they have to go back and go, oh, okay, well, this is what you did wrong and maybe that's right or no, it wasn't really clear from the evidence as to whether that was done or not. Just focus on feed forward. Video number seven is all about 360 degree feedback. 360 degree feedback is performance development. I don't think we should shy away from that. It is performance development, but it's an extremely valuable tool for certain purposes, but there are also things it can't do very well. Click on the link near this video to join us to find out about 360 degree feedback. <laughs>